All right, let's begin. Uh, I'm looking forward to going through this. Some of you have heard uh, bits and pieces of this, uh, but this is a message that I believe is going to, the first one kind of uh, set the stage and was really more of an introduction. This one we're going to get a little bit more into the meat and potatoes, and then uh, part three is going to be radical practical application. Major, major steps that you can use uh, in your relationships. And again, the whole point behind this series is so that at the end of your day, you can lay down your head at night and you can have real, real shalom. Not just be married to the person that you're married to, or not just have friendships, girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, you know, as far as uh, I meant uh, guys and, and, and their friends, uh, but, but we, we want to have real, dynamic, intimate relationships, whether it be with your wife. This is what I'm talking about right here. That's right. The only thing missing on this is a smiley face. <laughs> you got to love them deacons. They know how to deke. All right, let's begin. What are the three most important things in marriage, would you say? Everybody think of it right now. You have 10 seconds, T minus 10, to say what you think the three most important things in marriage are. <laughs> Guys, you, you have to come up with more than one. <laughs> and you can't repeat it. <laughs> Communication. Respect, love, loyalty, faithfulness, trust. You know, what's so funny is it's all the women that are blowing these out of their shofars tonight. Great things. This is what I, honey, you're right. Yeah. That gentleman needs a, uh, he needs a gift. That shofar will last a long time. That wasn't just brownie points, that was the whole box right there, brother. <laughs> All right, three most important things in marriage. Top three, in my opinion, are number one, communication. There you go. You can't have relationship without communication. We're going to talk about that. Number two, trust. In Hebrew, uh, it's the word is shema. It's faith and works. It's hear and obey, okay? Trust. Faith plus our works develops trust. Number three, love. Proved obedience to the communication. That's my definition of love that the Father gave me, is proved obedience to the communication. So when the Creator on high came on Mount Sinai or in the garden all the way down to the time of Yeshua, Jesus our, our Lord, when He gave in communication, He trusted that we would love Him by reciprocating through obedience. Communication trust, and love. CTL. Remember that. Number one, let's talk about communication. In the beginning was the Word. What was the number one? What is the number one rule of communication? Anybody know what the number one rule of communication is? If you've been through my premarital counseling class, you know what this is. Nope. You would think, listen, it's, it's the guys say listen because they breathe that into us every day. <laughs> listen to me! You're assuming there's an argument <laughs> or an offense. I said, what's the number one rule of communication? If you do the number one rule of communication on both sides, you will never have an argument that lasts longer than 30 seconds. Here, <laughs> don't speak. You're the one that gave the box of brownies to him. <laughs> That's right. We've got a long way to go. You can, you can earn them back as we go. Here we go. Number one rule of communication, if you get this right, your, your arguments will be cut in half, no question about it, is you cannot over-communicate. Ladies, would you agree with me? You cannot over-communicate. One of the biggest mistakes that men make is we don't communicate enough on the same frequency that your wife is communicating with so you cannot over communicate when you are speaking this is typically what is happening someone has a question about the communication that you are doing 
They're not totally sure because in your mind, how many know that you know exactly what you're talking about? Men, when men talk to men, we can say, hey, what's up, man? What's going on? You know what I'm talking about? And they go, absolutely. <laughs> the wives go, what breed are these beings? <laughs> Women, they, they, when they talk, they tell the same story four hours later. <laughs> because guys don't care about the details. All we want to know is you know what I'm talking about. Women, to know what they're talking about, first of all, we have no clue. So I'm convinced the reason why they talk so much and give so many details is so we'll leave and they can keep talking. <laughs> Over-communicate. Communication determines your role. This is really critical because many of us uh, don't understand our roles. If you don't know what your role is, I know you're a male, I know you're a female, we got that part right, but we got to understand what that role is. How do we walk in that role? Communication determines it. How you communicate will determine whether you're truly female or whether you're truly male. I know that sounds strange, but this works whether you're married or not. Communication is everything when it comes to building a business, when it comes to uh, running an organization, when you are leading two and a half million people across the desert, you better be able to communicate. If there's a, if there's a tornado, uh, you call uh, the, some of our shofar players up here. It's important that you communicate information properly. When Yahweh communicated in the garden, the way he communicated clearly defined his role. When he communicated, he, he communicated with authority, but with all-encompassing love and mercy and compassion. Let me prove it to you. When Yahweh, uh, when the, when Yahweh was in the garden with Adam and Eve, and Adam sinned, what was Yahweh's first reaction? I can't believe you did that, you moron. I made you and look what you go and do. Go sit next to that poison ivy bush now. <laughs> no. Adam was ashamed and, 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 and even hurt because he knew what he had just done and Yahweh's first response was to ask a question. That's part three that I'm going to be talking about is showing you the scriptural precedent in principle form of how to actually deal with offense and conflict. It's absolutely amazing how easy it is. We just don't know how to read the front of the book. Yahweh in the first few chapters of Genesis teaches us how to deal with arguments. Amazing. The first thing he does is ask a question. So he spoke and he gave us his word. Would you agree? When you speak, you're actually giving of yourself to the other person. It's coming from the inside. So what is the Hebrew word for give? It's Natan, where we get the word Nathan from. Any Nathans in the house tonight? Okay, no Nathans, all right. Any givers in the house tonight? There we go, we got some Nathans. See, you don't know your spiritual gift. Is give, Natan. It's Noon, Tav, and Noon. Okay? Noon, Tav, Noon. In ancient pictograph, it means the life of the covenant produces life. See how that works? The word Natan in its very Hebrew format is a cyclical word. It's a circle. It starts with noon, ends with noon. It has covenant sandwiched right in the middle of it. So noon is something that brings forth life which produces covenant, which produces life, which produces covenant, and it's a never-ending circle. This is why when you give, if you have problems with giving, seriously, on any level, I don't care what it is, husbands to your wife, giving of your help when you come home with the dishes or with dinner or with the kids or, or whatever, if you have issues with giving from that to giving and an offering, then there's something wrong with your heart. Because we are supposed to give out of the overflow and abundance of your heart. So it is those of us that have struggle in giving tells us that there is something wrong with what's inside because you should be first in line in a desire to give to your spouse, to your children, to your coworkers, to serve, to be a shamash. For deacon, as we, uh, the, the word deacon, is, 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 there's not really a Hebrew word for it. It's kind of two words. Zedekim, which is uh, like righteous ones, and shamash. And a, and, a, and, a, and a menorah or a hanakia would be a better example. 
Okay, the center candle, you have nine candles. That center candle is what? Higher than the rest. It's called the servant candle. And that Hebrew word is shamash. That's what a deacon does. He serves. He actually is the one that does the work, that gets out of his place and lights everybody else so that they don't have to move. They can do what they need to do. To give is to be a sadiq, a righteous one. How do we know that? Because there is no greater righteousness, there is no greater love than to lay down your life and give your life. Giving is all about becoming righteous. It is all about representing righteousness which brings forth the blueprint of the covenant. I have yet to sit down in, a, in marriage counseling and find uh, there's normally two issues that happen in marriage counseling. Number one, uh, either number one, there is no male authority that is over that husband. There's no accountability whatsoever. There's no one speaking into their life. Or number two, they're not giving. Someone's not giving. Because one concept that you will totally, hopefully, take home with you this evening is this. Yahweh created your wife as a cheerleader and you can't outgive her. It's not possible. She is, she is born to reflect whatever you give her. So whatever you feed that plant is exactly what's going to happen. So if you're upset with the plant because it doesn't have enough leaves, it does not does this, it not does that, and you put you know, kerosene on it, don't be surprised if it dies. It only does whatever you give it. Give it the proper amount of light, the proper amount of water. Okay, and, and, and listen, you can't just learn these concepts and say, fine, you need water? I'll give you water. I'll drown you. That's exactly what some of you do. It's making me thirsty. We need new life in our covenant to bring new life. To give, to put, to set, to make, to constitute, or ascribe to. To give. And these are the ancient pictograph in Hebrew. Where does giving start? The moon or the sun? Isn't that interesting? Because if you ask a child, I'll never forget this. I was driving in, my, in one of my cars years ago, and Elena was, was very young. It was at night. It was a full moon. You ever look at your kids and they're like, you can just tell the wheels are spinning like crazy. You know? She's looking at that moon out of the back window and she looked like this and then she looked back a few minutes later. and It's like, it's not like Elena to, to not talk, okay? She's very, very outgoing. She's our social butterfly and she's just like in, having this dialogue with the moon trying to figure this thing out. And all of a sudden she asked the question, she said, Dad, I think it's following us. But what that moon does not have its own light. What does the moon do? It reflects the light of its source. The sun is the light, is the warmth. It's just like the Father. The Father sends His light to the sun, and the sun reflects to us. It's a pattern of creation that Yahweh is the light. He sends the light to the sun, and the sun is a direct replication and reflection of its Father. It's what He said. In the same way, the husband is the sun, and the wife is the moon, and the moon is only reflecting exactly what it gets. So if, you have, if your house is dark, there's no light. And by the way, everything that I'm saying uh, is, uh, it does not apply to every single situation, because I have met women that, that strongly have uh, a, a past, that a trauma issue that has not been healed. So this is all predicated on the idea that you have gone through part one, you've audited your life in the physical, the soul realm, and the spiritual realm, and you have a clean slate. Because if you have trauma, and ladies, I have people have sat on my couch and, and find out that they were raped when they were eight years old, that's a problem that you're going to bring into your marriage and you may not even know it. We have to be clean. This is why it's so critical that you don't just listen to these messages, that you actually go back and go through them. Stop the tape. Take an audit of your life. Do a physical cleanse. Do a spiritual cleanse. Then go to part two and begin the process of implementing and understanding how to change some of these things. Yahweh speaks 
through his word. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, words come through your mouth. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. 1 Kings 17, 24 says, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of Yahweh from your mouth is the truth. Let me answer the question, what comes out of your mouth? Are you sure it's the truth? You know, we're real good at judging politicians because, you know, their, their private tweet somehow ended up on YouTube or all over the news or some private thing that happened in their house ends up all over the news. How would you like it if the worst day in your marriage ended up on YouTube or on Fox News? Are any of you any better? Every one of us have done horrible things. We've done things that we are terribly embarrassed of. And, and I hope to God that on Judgment Day, it is not a theater playing all of our works, actions, and words back through the speakers. What is the primary method by which our Father speaks? How about His Word? We know that. It's the primary method. What is the second method by which He speaks? His people. So this is a big problem because some of us are so embedded in His Word and, and so concentrated on wanting to know His Word that we forget that He speaks in multiple ways. I think the number three way, if not uh, tied with number two of Him speaking, is through circumstances. We're just so deaf, we can't hear that He's constantly speaking through the situations that are happening in our lives. From the flat tire to the, the traffic light to the song on the radio to you name it. He's constantly trying to get our attention. He is like your wife. Constantly wanting your attention. Constantly wanting to speak and have that relationship. So which people and how? Wives, Ephesians 5.22, this is fascinating. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, the Messiah, is the head of the ecclesia, the assembly. He is a savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. This verse has been taken out of context and, uh, and, 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 and blasted across the airwaves, telling women that you are down here, men are right here, and you better bring us a glass of water. Because I'm too busy watching the football game. By the way, make sure my steak is medium rare. Submit. Gentlemen, rule number one, if you have to tell your wife to submit, you are the worst head on the planet and she ain't going to submit. Oh, she may submit. But you're not going to like the consequences of the atmosphere of that home. So what we got to do is find out what does the word submit mean? What is it Submit. So what we got to do, we're going to do this little Bible study here. So in this teaching, you're actually going to learn how to study as well. Let's look at the verse before first. Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one unto another in the fear of Elohim. Submit yourselves to one another in the fear of God. You know, you're supposed to submit yourself to one another. Everyone should be able to speak into everyone's life. It, but it's the spiritual authority over you that has the final word. You should put more weight on that. When you're making decisions. Unbelievably, the way we make decisions, we call our best friend on the phone and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or we call, you know, the guy across the street. Hey, I know you just mowed my lawn for the first time, but I'm trying to think about what to do with my kid. I just don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? Instead of going to someone that is a spiritual mentor and getting advice from them. The body is so broken down, you got mega churches with one pastor or five pastors. How do you even minister to 5,000 people with five pastors? There's a church in town here that has two pastors, 3,000 people. Are you kidding me? Moses was Moses, and he had 70. And then he had leaders for 10,000s, and then thousands, and then hundreds, and then 50s, and then 10s. Everyone had someone to go to for advice and leadership. But let's go back here. The verse after that verse says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. See, we all want to say, Wives, submit to your husbands, but nobody wants to talk about the next verse, which says, Husbands, love your wives in this way. Die. You think I'm joking. The, the best way to get a, a woman's heart is to do it the old-fashioned way. Take off your jacket, put it on the ground, and let her walk over that puddle. 
That's dying. That's submitting yourself as unto the Messiah because that's exactly what the Messiah did. He took off of his divinity as the word of Yahweh, came down in the form of flesh and let us walk on him so that we would not step in that puddle of death. Husbands, love your wives and you won't have to say anything. She will follow you to the ends of the earth. Amen, ladies? Give her the love that she deserves. So let's look at a closer word of the word submit because it has two meanings. We better figure out which one it is. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Here we go. First, we're going to look into the Greek. And the Greek word there is 52.93 in the Strong's. So let's look it up. 52.93. It's a military term, meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In a non-military use, it was a volunteer attitude of giving in cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. Wow. Which one of these is the most often preached definition? Number one, wives, get in line, get behind me. I'm the boss, I'm the general, you're the corporal. This is where we're going. It's used in a military fashion. But this is scripture, ladies and gentlemen. It is certainly, and even in the Greek and I'm not a big fan of Greek, but even the Greek makes it abundantly clear that definition number one is not the definition for submit. The definition for submit in this use, it's a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and helping carry a burden. Does that not sound more familiar like Genesis when he says that she's created as a help meet? Okay. But we're going to go even further. Let's not believe this. Let's just continue to go further. So we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at, at Strong's 5293 and look at every single uh, verse in the Old Testament or we're going to find a place in the Old Testament in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Tanakh. This is how, uh, this is how I study. This is how you find out what real words in your New Testament mean is find that, take that Greek, go back to the Greek translation of the Tanakh that they translated 200 years before Yeshua came, and then flip it over to Hebrew, and there's going to be your real definition. So let's do that. 5293 ends up in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 24. Let's find out what this, what this scripture says. Flip it over into English. And all the princes and the mighty men and all the sons, likewise of King David, submitted themselves unto Solomon the king. Bingo. That's the Greek word. Now we flipped it over to Hebrew. And it's Strong's 5414. So let's go to Strong's 5414 and find out exactly what this word submit really means. Strap on your seatbelts. It's Natan. It's to give. They were giving themselves. There was no military concept at all. They volunteered. Did you catch the scripture? They voluntarily gave themselves over to the king. You know why? Nobody volunteers to follow a tyrant. They're forced to follow a tyrant. But if it's a good king, they will line up for miles to volunteer. Good leaders do not have to look far for servants to help lead because they want to. Again, life of the covenant breeds life. The law of first precedent says this. The very first time that word is used in your Hebrew Bible is God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Talking about creation. He submitted the, 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 the sun and the moon and the stars to give light on the earth. He gave them. He gave us His light. That's the definition of submit. Terrible, terrible, terrible translation in the New Testament in English. The word should have been wives, give yourself to your husband. Voluntarily give yourself to your husband as he does unto the Lord. A few verses later in 129, and God said, Behold, I have given you every green herb. It's no different than in English we have... Uh, uh, a phrase that says, I submit to you an idea. Now think about it. Am I submitting to you or am I giving to you something? You see the difference? Submitting something to you. I want to submit to you. 
I want to serve you. I want to give you an idea. Wives, you should have that attitude when you come before your king. Whether he's a bad king or a good king is indifferent. Yes, if he's a bad king, it's going to make it extremely difficult. At that point, you are serving Yahweh with your eyes closed because you don't want to look at him. If you look at him and his actions, you will forget about Yahweh who stands behind him. And you don't know what Yahweh is going to do to your husband. Could knock him on top of the head. Or it could cover him in his sin. It's his responsibility to correct. Give. Proverbs 28, 27. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. I'm just trying to prove to you over and over again the word submit does not mean this military term that you think would get behind me. Are you kidding me? Are we supposed to submit to the poor? We give to the poor. We give to the poor. Men give the light of the Messiah to their wives, and wives give the light that they receive right back. I can walk into a home in five minutes and tell you if the light of the Messiah is there because there's an aroma, there's a sense, there's a, uh, there a feeling. What is it? It's the feeling of the light, the character of the Messiah. I don't want to brag on, on my wife, but I can tell you this, that I cannot tell you how many times over the last... Uh, six years that I've been in the house that we're in right now, the people have come over for dinner. They'll, some point they come over the very first time. For those who've been in my house, you know what I'm talking about. And they'll say, man, there is just something about your house. It's so much shalom here. Because my wife sets that stage as, I, as he sets the stage through me. Now, it depends on what day they come over, how much shalom they actually get. Okay. The moon is supposed to receive its light from the sun. That's what its job is to do. So who gives first? Remember this? Now we're going to really mess with your minds. Who gives first? Remember what I said about the heart. On the right side of the heart, what happens? Oh, so we so forget so quickly. Your hearts are going to stop quick. You better get the answer. The right side of your heart receives the blood, the poor blood, that's right, and gives it where? To the lungs, which is the Holy Spirit, getting life infused back into the blood. And then she does what? She submits the blood. She gives the blood to the husband. And then the husband gives it to the rest of the body. And guess what it ends up happening? It ends up back to the wife. Because it's the second law of thermodynamics. All things that start at a position of perfection end up in chaos. Come to my house and you'll see exactly what that means at a dinner time. Shabbat table looks beautiful. Eight people later and an hour later, and dishes are stacked a mile high. And we love it, and we'll do it all over again every single week. So the point of what I'm trying to say is this, is that the husband is the one that receives from the wife. Now wait a minute, didn't you just say that the, that the husband is the one that gives to the, life, to the wife? Ah, here lies the problem and misunderstanding in marriage. Is that we have the, we, if we get the idea and we finally get it that the husband is the giver of light to the wife. He's the giver of the perfect blood to the rest of the body. But in order to do his job, because he was created first. So he was given perfect light, was he not? Goes throughout the body. So he's the one that gives perfect blood to the rest of the body. The problem is, is that in order the cycle to continue because of the fall of man and the second law of thermodynamics, that everything goes from a position of perfection to, per, to a position of chaos, he must be willing to receive in order to continue to give. And this is the problem of man. The pride of man says, I am the giver. I am the one that gives to the body. I am the spiritual authority. I am the one that gives. Pastors are the worst at this. Because pastors are the ones that seem to be the ones that confuse 
uh, having authority and giving. And they don't understand who gave them the authority. You understand what I'm saying? No man chooses to be an authority. He is ordained from on high, and where does he get the authority from? Yahweh gets it into the people first. Wait a minute, how do you mean the people first? How do you think they became leaders? Because someone's following. So by default, the people chose the leader through Yahweh. So Yahweh chooses the leader. They give to the body, and at some point, that leader that husband, that person, that friend, you must be willing to receive the negative information. Because Yahweh, man, God has given you the ability to clean it. He's given you, we're going to talk about that in a minute. You do not, you have the DNA to receive it. We don't like to hear it, but we do have the DNA to receive it. Women do not have the DNA to receive that negative information. We'll talk about that in just a minute. How does a president of an organization lead his team properly? By heavily leaning on the information that the VP and the other team members bring him. A good leader is surrounded by advisors. A good left heart is constantly waiting to to receive information so that he can give it to the body. It's a beautiful picture. Who is supposed to be your best friend, the one that will always tell you the truth, men? Your wife. If you're single, take this uh, into consideration about having best friends. Their job, if they're a true friend, is to tell you the truth. Not to agree with you all the time. Worst leaders will have yes men around them. I have learned in this ministry to listen to those around me. Because here's how I look at it. What if one of them is actually hearing from Yahweh And I shut that one out because I don't like, it makes, you know, it messes with me. I have my hand against the Father. So I want to judge every single counsel that I get. And say, Father, this person is sensing something. They think this is a bad idea. Is this you? And we go through that process. But if we don't even listen to counsel, we have issues. True friends will always tell you the truth. Here we go. Who was the most influential person in King's David life? King, I put it in, in brush strokes so, so it would confuse you. Nathan was the most influential person in King David's life. Now, if I say what was his best friend, what would you say? Jonathan. I'm going to submit to you the most influential person and real best friend of David was Nathan. Because what happened to Nathan. In 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 8, Nathan, you guys know the story, right? The prophet Nathan comes up to him and tells him about what? Stealing who? That's right, stealing Bathsheba, taking him as wife, and then going further and doing what? Killing her husband. Nathan was the one that had the guts. Where's Jonathan? Nathan, the man of God, the prophet, and true friend came up and said, hey, I I just want to tell you, I I think, uh, bad move. And because of this, this is going to happen, so on and so forth. Job of the best friend is to tell the truth, and that's exactly what Nathan did, because the, the, the friend of, do you find it interesting the word Nathan is to give? His very name was to submit, to give. I give to you, King David, the truth, and it's your, desi- uh, your decision what to do with it. Men, this is how we mo- mostly walk around right here. Constantly with egg on our face, but we don't know it. And your best friend is going to be the only one that's really going to tell you, women, it is your responsibility. Do not back down. Do not back down. I don't care how loud we get. Do it in love. But teach us the truth of what you see. Men, Get over yourself and your pride. It's time that we start receiving because that negative blood that's going on, we've we've got to know. If we got toxins in our body, in our family, your wife is probably going to be the first one to pick it up. Sometimes it's the other way around, but not very often at all. Ezer. What is an Ezer? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And Yahweh Elohim said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an ezer 
for him, a help meet. And by default, that means that we need help. I need help. You know why polygamy is, is wrong? Men do not realize that if you believe in polygamy, you are seriously admitting that you, have, you need unbelievable help. <laughs> Yahweh says, no, you only need one. Trust me. Help wanted. Single guys, get a clue. They're all going, really, 800 need one. Satellite systems, we talk about frequency, we talk about sound waves, we talk about things that you cannot see. Satellites do what? They're sending and receiving signals. Who does that better, men or, or wives? Men or women? Women. By far, they are better receivers and better givers. I don't understand how it works. It is almost as if when Yahweh uh, uh, was in the garden and he created Adam and Eve, uh, he took all the best stuff out, out of us and gave it to our wife and we were just stuck there with like a broken transistor. And they've got like an iPhone 5, you know. Who <laughs> built in everything. Here's amazing. There's only one single channel that a husband knows. One at a time. Wives is like NASA, man. There's like 500 screens at one time and they're watching everything and all at one time. And we can walk in the room and go, oh man, and we sit down in front of the sports center. While they're going, man, I'll tell you everything that's happening on all 722 screens. And I can tell you what's happening on the live stream on your phone that's in your back pocket. Because God gave them the unbelievable ability to multitask in an incredible way. My wife can be feeding the baby, changing a diaper, folding laundry, disciplining one of the kids, and talking on the phone at the same time while she's taking notes of the things that I need to do when I get home. <laughs> Me? I'm barely understanding the conversation I'm having on the phone to begin with. That's why I have an assistant, would they say? What is the message that the Father is trying to give you through your satellite? Because every husband gets one satellite. You're supposed to only have one satellite, one voice, one message. So if, if, if you understand and begin to absorb a little bit of this, you'll begin to appreciate, even if you're not married, appreciate the female species. <laughs> they are from a different planet, let's all just agree. But no, seriously, Yahweh wants to speak to you through your satellite. Are you listening to what she is saying? Many times the satellite is more right than not. True story, I went to Las Vegas years ago in a business convention with my wife, and, and uh, it was a there was a computer convention going on throughout the entire a city, giant, all the, it was, it was the international uh, computer networking uh, bonanza or something. And, uh, you know, I've been there before in conventions and I, not, I don't like going there at all, uh, but you walk through the lobby and it's always what? Very good. Nobody in here has been to Las Vegas. All these good people here. No, but it's, it's all these uh, slot machines, okay, and gambling tables. So I walk in the hotel and it was strange because nobody was gambling. Not one. It was gone. It was like hardly you know, nobody. Some, you know, lady in the corner or whatever, and that's it. Finally, I, I couldn't take it after, you know, hotel after hotel at the convention. I said, what's happening? This is weird. This is Las Vegas, right? People normally gamble here and it's normally packed. They said, oh, it's a computer convention in town. I said, okay, well, what does that have to do with anything? They said, oh, well, they're computer people. They understand math. So when it says 98% payback, they go, well, why would I do that? I give them a dollar, they give me back 98 cents. That's not a good deal. So they don't gamble. So they triple the prices of the hotels because otherwise they're going to go broke. They're smarter. See what we do, uh, those that are not very good in, in math and they like to gamble, it's a big sucker. Are you kidding me? 98% payback. Oh, I want to go to that one. You're only getting 98% of your money back. Point is, is they play by statistics. And for me in my household, I like to play by statistics. My wife is right 90% of the time, and I'm being highly conservative. So when I have an, a question or an issue, or I have an email, and I say, honey, should I send it? If she pauses, I know not to send it. 
Because she's right more than often, so I'm going to play statistics. Man, we should do that because you know I'm right. They are right most of the time. The mirror example, I love this, from Shalom Rush, from Garden of Peace. He gives this uh, example. This one's not mine, but I love this because he gives this phenomenal example that women are like a mirror. No different than the example I give that, that men are like a sun and their wife is like the moon. In most cases in, uh, in marriages, women are the mirror. They will reflect what they see. Unfortunately, what happens is uh, men will go up to a, uh, a, a, a mirror and this is what they see. So the man says, oh, I do not like that. And funny but not funny, he grabs the mirror and tries to fix it. Pretty soon, the mirror is not fixing his face. So he breaks the glass. You break your mirror and it's very difficult to put it back together. Men, be very, very careful with what you see because whatever she's giving you, she's most likely already received it. It's the negative blood that you probably caused or there's a trauma that happened in her life, either past or present, and you're not dealing with it because you're not looking beyond what you're seeing. How many times you come home and, and you say, uh, and you can tell there's something wrong with your wife, and so you say, you know, honey, are you okay? She says, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And you go and you watch TV. Women, you're laughing because it's exactly what happened. So we say, oh, no, no, honey, seriously, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Third time. This is how men think. I'm going to give her three chances, and then I'm off to the game. <laughs> honey, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> it is our job to be sensitive to what that mirror has to say because she is your chief counselor. You can't fix the mirror. Don't even try. The mirror tells the truth all the time, does it not? Sometimes we don't like it, but it always tells the truth. I have yet to sit in front of a couple. Out of all the couples that I have sat in front of, I have yet to sit in front of a couple where I have found, even if the wife has trauma and there's issues and baggage and they come and they're not clean and we haven't done an audit yet, I still have not found yet a wife that does, not, that, t- that does not tell the truth. Everything she says to her husband typically is the truth. I don't care what kind of adjectives or superlatives come out of her mouth. When I learned this first concept uh, years ago, I, um, I got in this argument with, with my wife. It was the first argument we ever had in our life, uh, just a couple years ago. And uh, we were in this argument, and uh, unbelievable. You know, my wife never cursed ever until she met me. She never even heard her parents curse. No, but seriously, we're in this argument. I, I, I tell the story, and it's candid, and it's just open chest, and it's gut honest because you've all been there. And man, I was, I just, I don't know what I did, but it was probably bad. Bad enough to when my wife cursed at me, and I took my, it shocked me. I mean, this is my angel, you know. And it was even a low curse word, but it's still, you know, if you can categorize them, it, it's still, I was like shocked, you know, because I thought this whole time for, for over 10 years, she was an angel that I was living with. And now, you know, boy, even Jim Staley can tick off angels. It's possible. So I took my glasses off. I just finished, uh, you know, uh, learning this and reading this book. And went in the other room. Did you call me that? He said his wife is the mirror and the satellite, so are you serious? Did you just curse at me? (laughs) And you know what he said? Well? (laughs) Are you? Yeah, I guess I am being that, ain't I? And I learned a real big lesson. It wasn't the word that mattered. It was the fact that I was being a jerk. I was doing those things. She was telling the truth. But you know what? The truth hurts, doesn't it, sometimes? We don't like to hear the truth. 
we want to hear good things. We want to hear that we have big muscles and that we are the greatest Superman hero that you've ever had. And we are the most godly spiritual person you've ever met and that we have never made a mistake. A godly man wants to hear every negative thing in his life because he wants to be the best leader. And a good leader, every Tuesday, you know what I do in our staff meetings? Everybody gets together. And I want to know what's going wrong. As much as what they're doing, I want to know. Where do you guys see it? Every once in a while, we'll do, a, do an audit. We got one coming up. They don't know it. Well, I will be asking them, I want you to write down everything that you see is a hole in our ship, starting with my character. What do you see? How am I treating you? I'm giving them way too much ahead of time to think about this. Uh, I want to know, because I believe that I don't want holes in this ship. This is Noah's Ark as far as I'm concerned. At least it's my Noah's Ark. And I'm carrying precious cargo, the word of Yahweh, and it must be delivered to some mountain where it can be dispersed into the four corners of the earth. Can't be holes in it. Husbands, make sure that you're hearing from your co-captain or you'll end up hitting an iceberg. When your wife comes to you with issues, this is great. I love this part because Yahweh is so much smarter than we are. He knows us men. We don't listen very well. So do they come to you one to one ratio of the situation? Or does it normally look kind of like this? Does it seem like men that our wives like magnify the situation? How many times have, have, have men have you said, you know, it's not really that big of a deal or, or I think you're over, you know, analyzing the situation. Do you know why she's exaggerating? Do you know why is that she's overanalyzing? Do you know why she's magnifying the situation? Because we won't see it until they do. If they came to us and they said, honey, I just want to say that, uh, you know, this is what I see. Unless you have progressed in your spirituality and your maturity that you could listen and actually hear it. So if your wife comes to you in a way that is probably disrespectful, you trained her that way. You're not listening. So she has to come to you no different than a child that you eventually say, oh, please stop hitting your sister. Please stop hitting your sister. Please stop hitting your sister. And then they cry. Yahweh primarily uses the wife to reveal to the husband exactly what needs to be corrected. They are the moral compass. They are the moral compass. They're going to tell you, you know, you were kind of harsh with the kids. Or you were kind of mean to your, your husband. Or you know what, you totally missed that hint that that person was trying to tell you. Listen, they're your moral compass. Yahweh primarily uses the prayers of the husband to reveal what the wife needs to correct. Husbands, if you have a wife that is not as spiritually mature as she needs to be, or even if she is, the very first concept that should come across your mind when you are offended or you want to correct her on something is to go to Abba first and even get permission to correct her. I'll tell you why in a minute. It is amazing. This concept goes against everything that, uh, that our flesh has been told in religious circles because we're told, hey, we are the leaders. We correct our corporals. But wait a minute. Yahweh put them as, 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 a, as a satellite so that when we can't necessarily hear or see our back, he'll speak to the wife and the wife will come up and whisper in our ear. So who's the one instructing her really? The king. So if I really want to influence her, then I need to pray for her. No different than praying for your enemies, even though she's not one of them. She is your biggest fan. But if you do get permission, you need to go to her gently and leave it on the table. It is not a prosecuting attorney trial. We don't go to our wives and try to convince them of their sin. You submit it to her and walk away carefully. Never turning your back. <laughs> okay. Women, it's amazing how they will receive correction if it's done in love and it's done quickly, short to the point, with prayer. They will receive it. 
All three times I've done it in the last 20 years, it's worked. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Feelings trump logic. You know what the theological term of this? Mercy triumphs over judgment. As we learned in the last session, feelings are always true. You might say, what? That totally goes against everything. Sorry. Let me prove it to you. I've got little ones. My little one, two years old, runs across the carpet, falls. There's not even a scratch. But she's crying. I don't know why she's crying. Dad's judgment says, well, you shouldn't have been running through the house. <laughs> Mom says, oh, come here. I'm so sorry that we put carpet in front of you. <laughs> it's Dad's fault. <laughs> you know what? To that two-year-old, it was real pain. We have no right to tell her what she's feeling is wrong. Get this through your mind. We have no right to tell them what they're feeling is wrong. If they feel it, it's real. Deal with the feeling. Logic is irrelevant for now. Even if you know that what she is telling you is not logically true, the feelings that she's feeling are always true and must be addressed and validated. I'm going to make a very bold statement, but it's very true. Most of the time in an argument, any argument really has nothing to do with a, with a woman at all or female. If you get in an argument, if you're taking notes, like here's what you need to write down. When you get in an argument, it will typically start off fairly logical and unreasonable. Then one of the parties will say something in an, it just continues to elevate that will be completely offensive to the other person. So then the other person at some point very shortly after that is going to say something totally illogical. Then the other person says, aha, I have found the hole in your ship. I will now prosecute you for that illogical term. That thought is not coherent and you will push them into the corner and prove them wrong on that illogical thought. And I'm here to tell you that your argument just divided into two. Because it first started out as something that was probably a reasonable cause for concern. And now you've got a whole other problem on your hand because husband, you trying to find your way out of what you deep down know inside of you is true. And now you're trying to flip it around. Women, do you ever feel like that? Somehow you end up being the bad guy in an argument. It's because at some point you're going to say something illogical. That's what we want you to do because then we can flip it around. Men, deal with the feeling because the feeling is what really matters. I'm, I'm feeling like you don't ever spend time with me. Are you kidding me? I sent you a card on your birthday. Really? Tell me more about how you feel. Well, I'm just feeling like I'm this and that and the other. Tell me more about that. I'll never forget the first time that I learned this concept. Uh, we and Cheryl normally only get to talk. I haven't actually seen my wife, I don't think, all weekend. But I, I'll get to see her in the evening and at night. That's about the only time when you have six kids is when you're in bed about 2.30 in the morning. And we sit and we turn over and say, oh, yes, you, that's you. I'm married to you. Let's talk. So we start talking. And my wife was offended at something that happened uh, throughout the day. And so I, I, I did it finally, one of my three times, that I did the right thing. And I said, uh, she was, I, clearly she was offended. I said, tell me exactly uh, what you're feeling. I didn't say, you know, what, what, what's going on or immediately get offended because she's offended, which is ridiculous. I said, tell me what you're feeling. This is great. 22 minutes later, I timed it. <laughs> I looked at the clock. She didn't know I'm laughing the whole entire time. She is just going on and on. And you know, they can't even look at you when they're telling you the feelings because it's just, they're just so bothered. And it went on and on and on. And do you know how, long it, how hard it is for Jim Staley to sit there for 22 minutes and not say anything? Out of the 22 minutes, 19 of them were completely illogical and I had 10 arguments uh, on, for every single one. But the Holy Spirit said, be quiet, do what I'm teaching you. So I said, okay, okay. Turn off my brain, open up my heart. 
22 minutes went by. Finally, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I just started busting up laughing. She's like, then she was really mad. (laughs) What are you laughing at? I said, I'm sorry. I've been married for however many years and I have never sat here and listened to you for 22 minutes you've been going. Give me some more. (laughs) You know what she did? She started laughing. And you know what happened? The argument was over. To this day, I have no clue what I did. It's the most unbelievable, most mystical, supernatural thing I've ever experienced because we didn't even fight. How could it be over? I haven't won. (laughs) Oh, I won. In her book, I was a big winner. Because the truth of the matter is, all she wanted me to do is listen. I don't understand it. Men... Just get used to it. They really don't want you to do anything else. When they come home from it, if they they work and they come home or they tell you about some problem they have with their girlfriend, don't try to fix it. Whatever you say is going to be the wrong advice anyway because you don't understand the opposite sex either. So just listen and say, I'm just going to pray for you. Let's just pray. (laughs) But honey, what do you think? I don't know. Let's pray. Don't take the bait. It's a trap. The second you take that bait, you're going to be in an argument. Honey, that's the worst advice I've I've ever heard. If I do that, I'm going to hurt her feelings. Oh my gosh, you asked me my opinion. Now she's like, why are you yelling at me? And off to the races you go. Remember the rule of 22. We're going to call it that tonight. The rule of 22. Listen until she's done. Men, when we want to change a tire because the treads are bad and you want to take the air out, we're grabbing a chainsaw, we're cutting the hole and get all the air out at one time. Women, they get their fingernail and put it on the little thing. Do you know how long it takes to get air out of a 45 PSI tire with, through that little valve stem? 22 minutes. I timed it. You know what's not funny is there was three other tires. But I waited patiently, so she decided to change those the next day. All right, here we go. Feelings trump logic. Humility wins every single time. If you defend the logic and ignore her feelings behind the logic, you will end up apologizing for the way you handled yourself anyway, so you might as well just humble yourself to begin with. Let me read that again. If you defend the logic behind, uh, and ignore her feelings behind the, lo- the illogic, you will end up apologizing for the way that you're handling the situation. So you just apologize up front and wait for the 22 minutes to be over with. It goes by so much faster. Women, how many times have you told your man at the end of four hours of arguing when he finally breathes a deep sigh and finally gets it after 22 times of hitting him with the frying pan, you said, if you would have just did that four and a half hours ago, we would be done. All I wanted you to do is listen and say you're sorry and mean it. There are some wives I sit down, they're like, listen, I don't even care if he means it. I just, I, he can read it from a piece of paper. <laughs> so funny story, I'm sitting in some <laughs> marriage counseling. They've been married for six months. And I'm teaching this concept of, of validating, all right, and validating, which we'll talk in a minute. And this husband just could not figure this thing out. I mean, argument after argument, he would defend himself, defend himself. He was like a prosecuting attorney. His wife was just getting exhausted. She started started counseling him, saying, listen, here's all I want you to do. Just say these words. I validate your feelings. So finally, we're sitting in in marriage counseling, and they're getting into an argument right in front of me. It was awesome. Front row seats. I didn't even have to pay for it. (laughs) So I'm like, this is unbelievable. It's like being in their house. I get to see exactly what the problem is. You are not validating her. So I told the husband, I said, John Jones, I said, here's what you need to do. And I physically made him get out a piece of paper and write these words. Honey, I understand where you're coming from. If I was in your shoes, I would probably feel the same thing. 
I apologize for, the, for making you feel that way. Please forgive me. Something to that effect. Wrote it down. I said, read it. At this point, the wife is like, you got to be kidding me. But I'm like, hey, this would be a huge first step if he can read. We need to first find out if he can read. Maybe that's the problem all along. He can't read. I don't know. We got to find out. So he takes the first, he takes the piece of paper. He's reading the piece of paper and changing the words. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> if I was in your shoes, I would totally just admit that my husband was right. I mean, it was unbelievable. I'm like, we're not going to go very far here. Read the paper. I should have just said, repeat after me. That's exactly why in, in weddings, it's real simple. It's two words because men will screw it up even at that point. <laughs> They'll start obloviating and making things up and humiliating themselves. All right, defend the logic. Don't do it, guys. Just be humble and wait for the 22. Here we go. Criticism. <laughs> now, your wife just got out of bed. She takes one look at you, and what do you say? <laughs> honey, I love you. And when she says, honey, does my hair look okay? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> honey, you sure? I made the mistake of answering the question once. My staff knows that I'm a perfectionist, and I can kind of critique things, and and uh, I'm always looking for a way to make things better. People like me, that's just what we do. I don't mean to be mean, but one time my wife came out and her, she had like, you know, I wasn't real hip on, one little hair kind of down and I didn't know that's the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> what do I know? She says, how does my hair, does it look okay? I said, well, you got, I don't really like that a piece of hair that's sticking down there. There's something wrong there. And she like almost cried. Uh, you know, like because I didn't know she spent like an hour and five minutes, you know, doing that one piece of hair. And here I'm thinking that she just totally missed it. I'm like, D -d 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 you do have a mirror in your bathroom, right? <laughs> you see, women have no ability to take criticism. Write that down, men. Stamp it on your friend's forehead right now. Grab a pen out of your wife's purse because you know she's the only one that brought one. Take it. <laughs> Pull to the guy to your right and write it on his forehead backwards so that when he looks in the mirror, he can see it. <laughs> Women, by default, in DNA, because they get so offended when we come to them with the smallest criticism, that is your clue from creation that they were not created to take criticism. They had no DNA for it. Not very often do I find a wife that a husband can go up and just start, you know, doing what they do to us. Uh, ain't going to happen. They can't take it. On the other side, <laughs> men, we not only get up like this, we go out like this. <laughs> and we don't even ask anybody what our hair looks like. 90% of us taking a poll, we don't even go to the, the, the mirror before we take off. The only place, reason why we go into the bathroom is to go to the bathroom. You know that that double bow sink, both of them are hers anyway, so what's the point of even going to it? When we built this house, I separated mine because I at least needed a place to put my toothbrush. You know, a guy, you can go up to a guy and you, and, and you can tell him, you can tell him, man, brother, your hair is totally messed up and what is he going to do? <laughs> oh, you missed the spot, okay. <laughs> All right, criticism. Men, by default, because we can take criticism... I mean, listen, when was the last time someone came up and said, you know, your tie's not on straight or your hair is, it doesn't look right or you got a big old pimple and we just started bawling? <laughs> I can't believe it. Like, my hair is out of place. I spent falling four seconds trying to get it fixed. I got to spend another five seconds. 
A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. We can apply this to your scripture, to your wife. It's pretty much the same thing. When your wife is offended, it is harder to win her back than a strong city. And I'm telling you, her contentions will be like the bars of a castle. She will hold her ground when she's offended. Because Yahweh put it deep down inside of her to not let go of the bars until she feels what she's supposed to feel. You know what it is? Teshuvah. How interesting. Yahweh's the same way. You see, the bars to his heaven, his shamaim, never come down until he hears and feels the right frequency, and that frequency is you dropping to your knees through teshuvah, repentance. When you truly repent for making a mistake, gentlemen, wives, it doesn't matter who you are, one or a hundred and one, if you want to win your friends and influence people, learn the concept of giving, valuing people, and surrendering when you're wrong. And if you don't think that you're wrong, you may think this is a joke. Be wrong anyway, because at some point in your, your life, you were wrong, and you didn't get caught. So pretend it's one of those times. Not a joke. That's what I do. I'm trying to learn how to do that because there's so many things I've done in my past. When I know that someone accuses me of something that is, that, that is not true, I know the right thing to do is to humble myself and let him judge. Why should I defend myself? Does a lion in the jungle defend himself? By default, he doesn't need to. He's the king of the jungle. He's at the top of the food chain. Truth is the king of the jungle. Did Yeshua ever defend himself? He didn't have to because he knew the power of love. He never defended himself, not even once. This is how you're supposed to deal with one another, ladies and gentlemen. And how many times has is, is you been falsely accused? We hate being falsely accused. But you know what? It's okay. Because all she's asking for is clarification. It may not come out right. Ignore the emotion. Deal with the feeling. Ignore even what she says. Deal with the feeling. Because that's all that's coming out of her is emotion and feeling through the things that she is saying. Make sure that you deal with the feeling. Honey, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I would never, ever, ever on my own will offend you. That's trash. Most of us handle it this way. I am so sick and tired of you of false accusing me. Do you know how faithful I am to you? Oh, she's buying that now. Ladies, would you want option one or two? One, of course. Just humble yourself. It's over just like that. Here we go. A woman's happiness is completely dependent on how her husband treats her. Is this not the truth? Her happiness, she doesn't care about money. She doesn't care about nice cars and big things. What she really cares about is how you treat her. Because how you treat her is totally connected to how she feels. And trust me, you're the one that's going to receive that light back. Whatever you give her is going to come right back. This is why when a husband does something wrong, when he has a, an adulterous affair or fornication or looks at pornography or, or, or treats her disrespectfully or, or is strong with her, snaps at her, or belittles her, criticizes her, those are toxins that go down into her soul. What goes in must come out. We're not created to hold on to toxins. They will manifest themselves in the physical realm. So when you dig deep into her and you move away that gentle soil and you plant those evil seeds of toxins, don't be surprised when she starts lashing out and all of these things come out at some point. She might even be silent for the longest time. And this will happen. I see this happen all the time. It's happened in my own life. 
even happened recently, because I'm not the perfect husband. I'm far from it. Sometimes I have a hard time following the very things that I teach. Anybody else out there like that? It's hard. You have to study this stuff. You have to anoint yourself with the Word and constantly be working on these things. Went to bed last week. I thought, fantastic day. So I get into bed. She hadn't seen me all day. I'm exhausted. Completely exhausted. I said, honey, I love you. Good night. She didn't say anything, so I figured she was already sleeping. Really big mistake. 22 minutes later. (laughs) I was sleeping four minutes. Out of nowhere, my wife comes out of her slumber. They say never wake sleeping babies. But my wife and her nice, and she was nice about it, but she definitely woke me up. Because there ain't no way that she was going to go to bed feeling the way that she was feeling. Anybody ever had that experience? And then the first thing you do is roll your eyes going, no way is this happening at 1 o'clock in the morning. Mistake number two. Because that's exactly what I did. Very first thing I should have did is look at the clock and wait 22 minutes and say, honey, tell me how you're feeling. You're the most important thing to me, and if we got to stay up all night long, I'll do it, because I did it in college, and I paid a $600 bill before cell phones were invented. I'm ready to do it again. We did it then to get them. Will we do it now? Will you do whatever it takes to make her happy? Really? Put your pride aside. Listen, when a wife has been criticized, She'll often become argumentative, angry, and every little thing will bother her. So if that describes your wife right now or a friend that you're around someone and they argue with you constantly, they're angry, it seems like every little thing that you do bothers them, I can assure you there is something in between you that they're filtering everything that you do through that filter. True story, someone just came up to me this evening, said that they've got a friend of theirs Uh, lives in a completely different state. And they were telling them how excited they are about Pastor for Truth and Pastor Jim Staley and all these things. And this person that they were talking to, they they were assuming that they were going to be just as excited. And this person was like stiffening up and cringing. And after a while, multiple people uh, talking about, you know, PFT and their experience and blah, 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 and just just all the neat things that you're always doing. Everybody started to recognize that this person is responding strangely. Every time we mention Jim Staley, it's like a seizure or something, you know. (laughs) After probing in a little bit longer, they discovered that somewhere down the line, I have no idea, years ago, years, I must have said or did something to offend this person. I know it comes as a shock. I've never done that before. Everybody that laughs is probably on my staff. I heard that, Matt. (laughs) But somewhere down the line, I had offended this person, and they've been holding on to that all this time. So everything positive that someone said, there was a filter where they became argumentative. You could tell they were angry. It bothered them. Guess Guess what her job was to do? Come to me. Big mistake when you try to forgive someone without going to them because nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that. It says when you have ought against your brother, guess what you're supposed to do? Go to them. 95% of all arguments are what? Miscommunication. So that means 95% of your problems can be avoided by going to someone and clarifying. Oh, you didn't mean to call me fat. I understand. I'm poofy. But guess what my responsibility is now? I have to go to this person and say, I am hearing through the grapevine that I have offended you. Can you tell me what's on your heart? And then she's going to say, you did this. And then I'm going to say, no, I did not. And you totally took me the wrong way. No, I'm not. I'm going to absorb whatever she says. It doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. 
What ma- it does not matter whether even what, if she overheard a conversation and came in halfway through and she thought I was talking about her and an offender, it does not even matter what the truth is. Even if I really did do something, the truth is, is that, that she is hurt. And clearly, not just my relationship, but her relationship with the Father has been stunted because of me, and that breaks my heart. How many people have you come across in your life like me that you ran over and you didn't even know the roadkill that you, that you have leaving behind? If you are spiritual and godly, it would break your heart to find out on Judgment Day as all of these victims of your life come tattered and bruised. It was that man. That's why I didn't accept Yeshua. He hurt me and ran over me and didn't even care. One of my best friends in the world came up to me this evening at the cafeteria during dinner and gave me a phenomenal analogy that I'm going to use and steal. Well, the first time I'll give him credit, but the second time it's mine. No, but it was a phenomenal uh, example. He said, Jim, the Lord gave me a vision, dream the other night. And uh, he said that I, I was standing before the throne. I was in this battle. I think this is how it went. Yeah, it was in this battle, this war. It was warring. His wife was there and, and they were battling together and so on and so forth. And then at the end was a, was a throne. And his job was to present his wife to the king. So he came up and presented his wife as she had bullet holes. And she was bleeding and she was tattered and torn. And this was the bride that he presented before his king. And then the second part of that, reverse the dream, starts over in a war together. This time he understood and he carried his wife before the king as he was full of bullet holes and he was bruised and tattered and he presented a perfect spotless bride. When was the last time you took a bullet for your wife? You know what a bullet is? A bullet can be stray or intentional. Will you take either one? How about for a friend? A parent? It doesn't matter whether they're wrong or right. Will, for the sake of restoration, love, and relationship, will you take the bullet? Because whoever dies first wins. Man, you want to make it a competition? Die first. Whoever dies first wins. It doesn't matter if she's right or wrong. Die for her and take the bullet. You get brownie points every time. On both levels, with your wife and with Yahweh. And I can assure you that if you unjustly took a bullet, there is a law in the Scriptures for that. It's called resurrection. If you were supposed to take the bullet, you deserve it. He'll heal you. But if you were not supposed to take the bullet, you will instantaneously be resurrected. It's amazing how that works. And without having to go into that, let's continue because we need to finish. A woman desires to be perfect in her husband's eyes. And his positive comments to her are her comfort and security. Not the expensive coat, not the car, not her house. It is your positive comments. It is positive comments. Science is beginning to understand that when you speak, you know that in Japan, they did this years ago and proved that they could take a glass of water, speak evil over it, put it under a microscope, and all of the crystals will be deformed. Take the same glass of water, speak life over it, doesn't matter what language, because Yahweh knows all language. Speaks life over the water, put the same water under a microscope, and the water crystals will be perfect like snowflakes. How is that possible? Because frequency transforms objects. We know that. Even in Hebrew letters, when you speak and chant certain Hebrew letters, they've done, you can go on YouTube and watch this, and have a, a, a sand on a pie plate, they will vibrate and end up in the form of that letter. I don't know how it works. You can take a particular, what do you think a laser is? How, how come you can get damaged by microwaves? How is it that possible that you put a phone up to your ear long enough and they'll prove to you that this part of your brain will have more radiation? 
Because sound and frequency and vibration and everything around you affects you. So when you speak negative, it is toxicity. It is like radiation to your wife. She will respond to that. When you speak life and positive comments, she will be like a flower that will bloom in front of you. If you're not attracted to your wife, it's because her flower is either closed or you broke it. There is nothing more disgusting than a rose, a flower, a rose with no rose. What is that? A thorn bush. Don't pick off your wife's petals. If anything, pick them off the ground because someone else probably is doing it too and put them back on. Yahweh will stitch them back together. We all have those issues. If she comes home and she's got her petals coming off because somebody hurt her feelings, take that petal and put it right back on. Don't try to fix her problem and tell her how she shouldn't be offended. She's offended. Put it back together. Act like you have a two-year-old and when she falls, embrace her. It doesn't matter if she shouldn't have been running. Make her feel better. Amen, ladies? And you know men are the same way. We are just big kids. We need that comfort and security too. So ladies, let me rebuke you for a moment because I've been picking on the men all night long. Your husband is what you say in private. You want to talk about your husband and tell him how horrible a person he is? Most of you are very confident and bold to do it to his face. Don't be surprised when he becomes that because you're speaking evil and his cellular structure is changing. Speak life over him. Honey, I know you can do it. You are a cheerleader. You are our helpmeet. There is not a guy out there that if his wife, if you're running a race and he can hear your voice over the crowd, is not going to push harder, work out more, and try to win that race. Because his girl is cheering him on. Believe in your husband. If he's not the spiritual head of your household, believe in him. Create dignity. Pull him to the next level. Not by false flattery, but by telling him that you believe in him. I know that you're new to this whole spiritual thing, but honey, I trust you and I believe in you because you are the best spiritual leader Faith is the substance of what you can't see that already exists. I want my children to be godly young women that love the Word. So I will speak to them when I pray with them. And I will say, I will say Father, thank you that you've given them the desire for the Word, even if they don't have it. I believe it's already there. And amazingly, I will find my daughters reading the Word by themselves, sometimes at 12 o'clock at night. Do you ground them for that? I can't figure that one out yet. I'm not totally sure. I seriously had a parent call me once and say, I don't know what to do with my daughter. She, since she started uh, getting these resources and learning about her Hebrew roots, she's, she's up in a room watching YouTube on your channel. And I caught her at 2.30 in the morning. I put her to bed at 11 o'clock. It's the sixth time this week. I said, well, it could be worse. Let her go. Gentlemen, this is what happens to your house when you engage in these actions. It will destroy it. There is nothing that will destroy your home faster than criticism. And this is the epitome of criticism. Look at this picture. There's no way to stop that fire. It will burn the house down. We've got to stop it. Focus on the Family had a conference of pastors. And they found out at the end of the conference that 80% of the pastors had watched pornography in their hotel room. And we wonder why the rest of the body has issues. We need to get this fixed. How do we do it? I can tell you how to do it. You know how? Because I've been there. I was heavily addicted to this years in, right off the bat in our marriage. And it took a long time. Praise the Father. It works. And you can be free, gentlemen. 
you do not have to have that spirit of lust or that terrible, terrible shame and addiction in your life. There are ways to get out. I'm going to give you some of the things that worked in my life. First of all, clean your temple by recognizing and removing the spirit of lust. This will require you to open up your chest and be accountable to someone else as well as your wife. Hold it in. It's like cancer inside of you. It will kill you. You, you, The fastest way to get rid of the darkness is what? Turn on the light. So, you're humiliated. What else is new? Open up your heart. Let the light in, darkness flees. Number two, resist the temptation by setting up a Torah fence. Personally, even to this day, I still use a program called Covenant Eyes on my computer. You know what it does? I love it. It doesn't block anything. I can access anything I want on my computer. The only thing that I have to remember is it's going to send every single link to my wife. It's going to send her a report once a week, and she's going to have access to everything that I saw. It's real hard to click on something when you know her email is going to have a report. And it's so detailed, it'll say, a review is needed. Every single person on our staff has this installed on their computers. Number two, this one's really important. Confess everything to your wife. Everything. If you're not married, find someone and confess everything. I've gotten to the point where I'm confessing stuff before I even do it. I have the gift of prophecy. I know I'm going to mess up, so I'm going to confess it now. (laughs) No, but seriously, this will save your life. Your wife, believe it or not, I'm telling you, and wives, if you're not this way, you need to get this way. Most wives that I've met, they would rather you come to them and just tell them. Just say, you know what, I had something pop up on my computer today, and I'm sorry, I looked for, for two seconds. I shouldn't have even looked that long. What you think is going to break her heart? She's thrilled that you care enough to come to her to establish a relationship and an intimacy so you can pray together. You're forgiven the four seconds that you started to even say, I need to talk to you. Am I right, ladies? Can I get an amen? Amen. And if you're not that way, you should be that way because you want your husband to be transparent, do you not? And it would be the fastest way, because if every time you had to tell your wife something, it becomes more difficult to sin, because you're accountable. The enemy wants you to keep it in secret. Oh, don't tell her that. It's going to bother her. It's going to ruin her day. Yeah, it might ruin her day. But what you don't know is you are spiritually connected. You can't get out of it anyway. She's going to know. True story. Years and years ago, I was at my office. This is probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago. It was at my office. Something came up on my computer. Within 10 seconds, you know how fast it happens, guys. I was on a porn site. Well, lasted like 10 seconds. I got convicted, got off. My wife calls me five minutes later. Jim, what's going on? I did what every guy does. I denied it. Nothing. Having a good day at the office. I was, my heart was pounding out of my chest. How did she know? Because I confess everything. So what am I doing when I confess? I'm creating intimacy to the garden. We're becoming one. When you confess to your your king, what's happening? He accepts you because of teshuva, and you're becoming intimate with him because of your confession. It starts in, in the garden. It starts in the confession of salvation, and it never ends. The moment you stop confessing is the moment you distance yourself from your king. That's why there are people that need to be here tonight that won't show up because they know what I was going to talk about. They can't stand to hear the truth. Because that means that they're going to be accountable, and they're going to be forced to be transparent. Men, tell your wives everything. I have heard of pastors that say, oh, you don't need to tell them this. Keep your skeletons in the closet. No, you keep skeletons in the closet and they will come alive. I'm telling you the truth. If there is something that you have in your past that you know the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind right now, you need to confess it. Because if if you don't, and you're spiritually connected to your spouse... It's affecting her anyway. 
Because there's no such thing as past, present, or future when you're a spiritual being. Everything that you do in private and in public is connected to her, or the Bible's not true and you're not really one, and it's just a fairy tale. It's just good language. Oh, we're one. Isn't that nice? From his perspective, he's supernatural. When he says they will become one, he's talking about like it was in the garden before he separated them. The mind is the same. The heart is the same. They do things the same. The right hand knows what the left hand is going to do before it works. The right and left brain work together. Boom, boom. Heart, heart. Boom, boom. That's what he wants in a marriage and a relationship. But that begins with intimacy. And when you mess up, repent. And that goes for ladies too. This is the number one way to get rid of sin in your life is confess it. The Bible says confess your sins to one another. It's too easy to say, oh, I confessed it to Yahweh. He says confess it to one another. When you do something in private against your wife, you're sinning against her. According to the Torah and the Brit Hadashah, you're required to go to her even if she doesn't know. Did you know that? doesn't matter. You, it says if, you, if you've created ought against your brother, you are to go to them and apologize. It doesn't matter whether they know it or not. This is called integrity. You back out of Walmart and you hit someone's car. Oh, they don't know about it. I can leave. That's the same exact doctrine. Is it not? What's the godly thing to do? Write it on a piece of paper, your name and phone number. That's what we do when we mess up in private, men confess it. Get accountable to another man as, man as well. Continuing, make a covenant. Be like Job. Job says, I made a covenant with his eyes. You don't even think the most godly men had issues? Every one of them. Murderers. idolaters, All the, the sins and sexual sins. There's nothing that's new, ladies and gentlemen. Are you kidding me? Solomon. Look at Solomon. Wisest man on earth. Yeah, right. He had 900 wives. Is he nuts? He was wise only in the beginning. Make a, co make a covenant. You will never type anything in in a search engine that you could potentially bring up something unholy. Never type it in and it won't come up. Something does come up, make a covenant to never click on it. Do it between you and your king. You know what I did? I went further. I did what my ancestors did. I went and got a truck full of stones. Went out to a piece of public property and I built an altar like my ancient forefathers did when they made covenants. And I made this covenant. Bam! I can take my kids there today and show them. This is where Abba began to get his life fixed. Immediately look away from temptation. Don't even take the bait. I'm simplifying this. It is a process. But if you do these steps, even one of them, you'll begin to see yourself going in the right direction. And last but not least, what is this? It's an interesting slide I found. What's wrong with this picture? Yes, they are on the same team. You didn't catch that, did you? They're on the same team. Men, understand this concept. Your wife is on your side. She wants you to be successful. She wants you to be holy. She does not want to tear you down. She wants to lift you up. But you must create the right atmosphere and soil for her to do so. If you're going to be, you want a cheerleader? Be the quarterback. You want to sit on the bench? Don't expect her to cheerlead for you. And don't be surprised if she starts cheerleading some other guy that's playing on the field. I have yet to find an affair where the woman has an affair where it is not linked to the man because I don't believe it exists that a woman will drink from a well when she is not thirsty at home. She will never drink from someone else's well when her well is full of... Uh, are you kidding me? Women are too smart. They will only drink from another well when their well is so dry that they feel like they're going to die. And some guy comes along, bats his eyes, says something really nice, opens the door. It takes almost nothing, does it, ladies? Nothing when you are that dry. A hello in a nice voice. And immediately she begins to come alive. 
Guys, if, you're, if your wife is not where you want her to be, here's the answer, and we end with this. Compliment her. It's the fastest way. Speak to her positive thoughts. Listen to her and give her praise. You want her to be a cheerleader? Show her how. And you will see her do cartwheels for you. At the end of the day, it's all about getting rid of the enemy and going back to the garden. It's not just you in your house alone. There are two other spirits. Hasatan and Yahweh. There's four people in the garden at all times. Who are you listening to? Most of the time, Yahweh is going to speak through your wife to you. Please, take it into consideration and go pray. If she's wrong, take your chances. But after you pray, you'll find 99% of the time, if you are a godly husband and you desire to do it, try me on this one. Hear it. Listen. Shh. Don't speak. Go pray. Come back and see what happens. When I get in an argument with my wife, one of the first things I will do is go pray. Whenever we pray together, matter of fact, uh, this happened uh, the same, same time, a couple weeks ago. Got in an argument in bed because I was a blockhead like normal. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to pray. She's like, fine. She wasn't going to pray with me because she hadn't had her feelings dealt with yet. I knew I had no capabilities to handle what she was saying. None. And I was too lazy to get out of bed and go pray. So I decided I'm just going to pray. I was angry. But I'm following my own rules, and I, and I, I believe are His rules. And I turned over on my stomach and got up on my, my elbows, and I started praying to my king and telling, and I couldn't believe what came out of my mouth. I'm angry because she's offended. The next thing I know, I'm repenting to him for whatever I didn't even agree with. Next thing you know, our argument was over. All I did was pray. She's like, that's all I needed. Guess how long my prayer was? 22 minutes. <laughs> I knew that's how long it takes for her to calm down, so I just kept going. Guys, are you hearing me? Love your wives. Lay your life down for her, and she will lay her life down for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. I know that it's late, but Father, it is so good to bask in your word. We need to know these things and learn these things. Would you be with us in our relationships? Would you teach us how to pray? Would you teach us how to be quiet and absorb others emotions help us to love one another as you love us you sent your son to die for us would you teach us how to die for some reason we don't want to die and your word says that there is no greater love than for someone that would lay down their life for a brother much less our wife who it should be a piece of cake to do father we are really carnal teach us to be spiritual teach us to respect one another to be gentle and kind, faithful, all of the gifts of the Spirit so that the next generation won't even know what sin is. Father, thank you for this time that we've had this evening. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your instruction manual. And most of all, thank you for your mercy and your grace. with all heads bowed and eyes closed. And I mean that. I'm going to ask a question to you men. Men, if you would agree and say, you know, I'm one of those men that criticize my wife and I have hurt her deeply. I want you to raise your hand, not to me, but to him. Thank you. Yeah.
You can put your hand down. I could go through a litany of sin. I chose criticism because it is at the top of the list. And every other sin seems to be connected to those negative comments. So Father, I lift up with all these men that struggle in loving their wives the way that you want them to love. And I ask, Abba, that you would forgive them by the mere fact that they had the strength and the courage to raise their hand. I pray in Yeshua's name that they would be free. Father, for anybody that has any unclean spirits in their life, whether through trauma, whether through their personal sin or generational curses, I speak upon their behalf in Yeshua's name and break those curses even now. Those curses do not exist from here on. Heal them, Father, in Yeshua's name. Hasatan, you are to be mute and deaf and dumb. You're not allowed to speak lies anymore. You're to walk the dry places, never to return. Abba, fill those voids right now. In Yeshua's name, and all of Yahweh's people said, Amen. God is good.